What's going on, everybody? Welcome to yet another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. And Cole and I are excited to say that this is another episode that you can claim ACPE accredited continuing education credit after listening uh, to the episode. Uh, we've partnered with freece.com so that listeners can get that continuing education credit. Um, the link will be in the show notes, so you can just kind of follow that and it'll take you to their website. And for FreeCE members, this is a you know option that's included in your membership. There's no additional cost or anything like that. Um, you just follow the link and go take the post test, which you should obviously ace after listening to the podcast episode. Uh, there's an evaluation as well that you can, you know, just click all fives for, and that'd be great. And then, uh, the password, when you go to take the test, we'll hit, um, in all caps, just type in ringworm, uh, and it'll unlock the post test and the evaluation, all that good stuff. And, um, just kidding about the all fives. We want, we actually want your feedback. So make sure you answer correctly. And, uh, if you're not currently a free CE member, um, we definitely want you to kind of look through their options. If you can, um, they have have an unlimited membership that offers monologues they have or monographs rather they have um like live ce that are you, know, you can actually hear someone live speaking through like more lecture style they have pre-recorded lecture styles they have our podcasts and um, the unlimited membership cost is discounted by 15 percent off um, if you use the code podcast 2022 all caps um, at the checkout and that link will also be in the show notes so make sure you check that out Cole, how's it going, man? It's good. Have you uh, renewed your license yet? Not yet. Due at the end of the month, right? I think so. I was able to knock mine out, and um, I, I just realized that my BLS is also expiring, so <laughs> I had to do kind of an urgent uh, sign-up for class on Tuesday. Yeah. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, do can we just take our own post test that we created for for the for scene. our continuing education? <laughs> do you think do you think that's allowed? Not, you know, I guess it's up to it, NABP. They'd it, probably be fine with that. It right? seems like a reasonable option since we did obviously prep for it, prep and create it. I think we're however think we got enough out of it. Right? I don't know <laughs> if that would be frowned upon or not. Yeah, I so. didn't, but that was a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, that, that I think uh, I'll definitely use uh, Free CE's uh, content, but I probably won't use my own just yeah. in case. Yeah, because that might that. that might be a little sketchy. But uh, for this BLS thing, we they could um, during COVID they would just send you the the videos to watch, and you would just watch them, and then you would go in and you know pump some uh, pump a chest or whatever of a dummy, mm -hmm. and then you're good. But uh, of course that's over now, so I have to sit there for three hours and go through the whole thing. Go through the whole thing. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, you know. It's important, I guess. Important uh, knowledge to have. Yeah. I, I think I remember from the yeah. last time. <laughs> you know. Yes. So today, what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about, uh, I guess you could call it dermatophytosis, right? Yeah. Some, some uh, very common um, skin infections that you would run into uh, that I'm sure a lot of us have actually experienced. Um, but yeah, infections dealing with dermatophytes. I think that's a good question. Have you ever had uh, any of these? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ringworm? Yeah. A hundred percent. The one I can, I think I've only had it once. The one I can remember was athlete's foot, uh -huh. the uh, pettis, and um, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I, I was in like eighth grade or whatever. Uh, very itchy. Very uh, common amongst like wrestling and grappling type sports. So yes, I've had it several times. I did not do wrestling or grappling, but I guess I'm sure my shoes were gross and my uh, cleats. I'm sure yeah. were disgusting. Yes, unfortunately, I've definitely definitely had to have my fair my fair uh, share of lamisil applications. Yeah. there's going to be a lot of synonyms used today. By the way, dermatophytes, dermatophytosis, ringworm, athlete's foot, jock itch. And then the actual medical names for all these things. But yep. we will go through them all. And uh, But just so you don't get confused, there's a lot of synonyms. The other thing, just to be aware of, we're probably going to butcher some of the names as well because there's a lot of uh, species names and things like that. I think some of these are fake. There's no way these are all real, <laughs> real terms. Dude, based on my knowledge of Latin, yeah. um, I'd say they're, I don't know, probably fake. Yeah, I think that's a good... Uh, that's, yeah, that's a good thing to say up front is that we acknowledge that we do not know how to pronounce these, but for your benefit, we're going to do our best. Yeah, we're going to we're going to try as hard, as hard as we can, so don't laugh too hard if we do butcher anything. Yes. But um, dermatophytes, basically, it's a species of fungus, um, filamentous fungi. Uh, they are typically known to colonize um, and also digest keratinized structures, so like the stratum corneum, um, so skin, hair, nails are the three very common places that you'll see them. Uh, they are superficial infections. Um, you know, you don't usually get more 
uh, penetrating with deeper infections. Um, sometimes you'll see that with like immunocompromised patients and things, but for the most part, pretty superficial. And uh, you also can be associated with some localized inflammation and you know irritation, depending on the situation or the extensiveness of the infection itself. But um, like we were talking about, you know, very common, and I'm sure even regardless of which. Uh, kind of practice setting you're in, um, whether you're in an ambulatory care setting or even community retail setting, you're going to have somebody come up and ask about this because uh, very, very common. Yes. Um, so I'm going to start with some some names. Some um, Are they called, uh, what is it, genera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Genus. Yeah. yeah. I, I saw some other pluralism of it. But yes, the, the, the genus in each individual species, I suppose. Um, and, and we'll see if we can pronounce them. So... If, We'll go over where they tend to um, accumulate and infect, but uh, for hair, skin, and nails, um, there's frequently trichophyton, and there's um, trichophyton rubrum, interdigitale, um, mentagrophytes, tonsorans, and varicosum. What do you think? I think you're great. Okay. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Um, for hair and skin, there's also microsporum, um, microsporum canis, and persicolor. Those are common fungi to infect those areas. And uh, along with more skin and nails, we have epidermophyton, um, flacosum. And then there's also arthroderm, tenomyces, guaramyces, lafophyton, nanisia, and paraphyton. Yeah, I think you nailed that. Did I nail it? I actually felt pretty good about it. I'm not going to lie. That was impressive. I'm not sure about nanisia. You just can't. That's my favorite one. It sounds like a pizzeria downtown. I was just going to say, it looks like it, it, it probably because it has the uh, you know similar spelling at the end there, yeah. but definitely looks like a pizzeria. Yeah. I'm but, sure uh, I'm sure you can find that as New York's best pizza, nanisia. If you name that your pizzeria after that, good stuff. And then I, I do have to point out that pizzas. I have to point out that Tinamyces, I think, has a silent C. Now that threw me off. But what I mean, can you think of any other way to pronounce that? No, I think you know. And also, I like that you got thrown off, but none of us listening knew you yeah, got thrown off. But just you so y'all know, it. there was a silent C. Yeah. In Tinamyces. Nah, that was that was that was impressive. Right. Thank you. I, I, I like that. it. Um, so, dermatophyte spores basically are acquired from direct contact with human or animal carriers, typically. Um, also, can be just from a contaminated surface, uh, clothing, towels, bedding, combs, things like that. And, you know, it's one of those things that... Uh, when a patient, if they've never experienced this before, um, I've, I've actually had a patient in, that I see for diabetes management that had contacted me about this and uh, describing the symptoms and stuff. It was uh, a um, ringworm type infection. Uh, and uh, when we were talking more about it, she was kind of just appalled that uh, she had this. And she's like, does this mean I'm like dirty? Or I was like, no, 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 no. You can get it from anywhere. And uh, it just is a matter of coming into contact with the, the organism. So definitely doesn't mean anything like that. We do want to, once you have, uh, you know, an active infection, we want to treat it obviously. And then we want to make sure that anything that could potentially have a contaminated surface is, is cleaned or, you know, right. and, and sanitized. But, um, you know, but no, by no means does it mean that uh, you have you know, you're a dirty patient or something like that. No, and recontamination is very common, especially yeah. if that's not uh, if that's not done afterwards. Absolutely, uh, but it, like we said earlier, it is the major kind of cause of a lot of like superficial fungal infections, um, and the common term for it is ringworm. You know, tinea is the proper name for it, and depending on where the, the actual infection is located, that's um, you know where. The second part of the, the name will be, so botinia is where we kind of all start with, and uh, ringworm is the common, um, you know, phrase that we all kind of throw around. But when we're thinking about, like, location, you know, and this is not going to cover uh, all of the, the different potential kind of breakdowns, but um, when we think of, like, on the scalp, for example, tinea capitis, um, and then they also have specific, you know, areas not just on the um, – scalp but on the like facial hair for guys uh, or the beard areas you'll see a lot of uh, uh, resources kind of reference tinea barbe um, you have tinea pettis which is on the feet um, tinea crucis which is the groin area um, tinea corporis which is the um, like standard ringworm on the rest of the body that we would kind of uh, typically think about and then the one that doesn't use that phrase tinea is when it's on the, the nails, um, fingernails or toenails. Um, the oncomycosis is the typical term you'll see utilized for that. Um, and then, like we said, that you know these are superficial infections. However, immuno 
compromised patients can potentially have a little bit deeper infections, but that's pretty rare. And uh, a lot of the pathogens are going to be the same in, in immunocompetent and immunocompromised, um, regardless of you know the, that their status there. Um, but it, it can know that in some more rare can, cases, you can get uh, deeper infections. Right. And uh, going back to the reinfection for a second. So a lot of these infections are very common in pediatric patients, especially tinea capitis. Um, and so siblings or people that the other kids that they're around can have, um, can be asymptomatically colonized, I guess. So if, a, if, a, if, a, um, one of your kids is treated, uh, it's probably good to, um, to check on the other ones as well. Um, and, um, so the term tinea, did you know, uh, originally indicated larvae of insects that fed on clothes and books? I did not know that. Well, it's true. And then, uh, after that, it kind of meant a parasitic infestation of the skin, and it wasn't until the 16th century that it was used to describe diseases of the hairy scalp. And I'm assuming that's because they thought, and that's probably where they came up with the name ringworm, maybe, because yes. they thought it was an actual parasitic infection? Yes, and, I mean, of course, also the way that it it grows in the circular pattern yeah appears of like a ring but like the worm portion yeah mm -hmm. almost like it's like some sort of parasitic infection yeah and i've even heard you know people that are i heard a wildlife biologist one time talking on a podcast and he mentioned uh ringworm when they were out like in they, had, they were working on some indigenous tribe trying to find some uh animal that was almost extinct and i'm trying to you know do conservation stuff and he, even someone who who's very educated when it comes to that kind of thing he he mentioned ringworm and it was like yeah they had to give anti-parasitics to kill off the worms i was like uh-oh <laughs> someone doesn't <laughs> when know i heard of ringworm is. when i was a kid i did always imagine like a worm oh yeah you know for sure i'm i'm fairly confident this might be a complete lie, and if my mom hears this, she'd be mad. But I think that one of my parents told me something about a worm as well. I'm, I'm sure. Unless that was a scare tactic, which I mean, also could have been the When thing. you're a young boy, I mean, people talk about all sorts of stuff. I, re I, I remember my main um, association with ringworm was to never, if you had to go number two in the woods, mm. never use what? leaves. <laughs> this is what I was told. We grew up in different, I think, parts of the state. <laughs> never, never. I did, I did a lot of outdoor stuff. Yeah, yeah. Never use leaves um, because you could get ringworm. On your buttock. Ah, that's what they would, I did that's not what hear the, that. That's what the kids would say. So man. I never use leaves. I just wouldn't use anything. I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know that that, that was the situation. I feel like I was always near a bathroom because <laughs> I lived in the city. But <laughs> no, I did not grow up in the city. Um, but there you go. Yeah. Don't tell your kids lies. Yeah. Um, don't tell your kids lies. But, anyway, so of course these are. Um, this is a fungus. These are fungi. Yes, um, not so, worms. So, so to treat them, you're not going to use uh, antiparasitics. You're going to use antifungals. So we'll go through some of the common um, classes and some of the common drugs uh, because there's a lot of overlap with them. There, it's, it's not the same thing with each one, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, like Mike said, they're, they're superficial infections, um, but uh, it, sometimes it does need to be treated with a topical agent um, and or an oral agent as well, depending on where it is and uh, the severity. Um, so azole antifungals will be the first ones we'll talk about. Um, so clotrimazole uh, is a very common one. It's available in multiple different um, dosage forms, uh, atroche, lozenge, um, topical uh, agent, and vaginal cream. Um, the troche could be useful if a patient has oral um, candidiasis. So, of course, not, um, not uh, what we're talking about today, but uh, that's one thing the troche is useful for as well. Um, voriconazole um, is branded as VFIND. Um, that would be the drug of choice in aspergillosis. Um, it covers um, C. clabberta and cruce. It um, does not have activity against zygomycetes, but it does have some adverse effects. Liver damage, visual disturbances, phototoxicity, and QTC or QT prolongation. Uh, and then posiconazole, noxophil would be the brand name, has a similar spectrum to voriconazole, plus it does cover zygomycetes. Um, I I'm, doubt I'm saying that one right. Adverse effects would be QT prolongation, and um, it's a suspension that's given three times a day or twice a day. Also comes as a tablet given twice a day, um, initially and then once a day thereafter. And it's one of those things that uh, we also have like itraconazole um, is another oral version of these. And we wanted to kind of mention these azoles because 
oral options are uh, potentially used in, in dermatophyte infections as well, especially like recurrent infections. However, they're definitely not first line. And so we just kind of want to throw these out there. If we are going to use one of these, it's probably going to be clotrimazole. Um, and we'll get to some other azoles that come only in topical form in a little bit. But uh, just kind of to mention these just because, you know, for review purposes and all that. But for voriconazole, where we're covering like Canada species that are resistant, like the glabrata and crusi, like Cole was saying, um, you know, posiconazole, these are way overkill for what we actually need them for. Itraconazole would be the, the one that if we had to, to kind of escalate therapy, um, fluconazole as well is another oral form. If we had to escalate therapy and like use an oral agent with one of these, those would be the two. But even in that case, you know, we have uh, some other agents that are a little bit better, um, a little bit more efficacious. And then like itraconazole has so many drug drug interactions. Mm -hmm. So always be careful with that one. Um, <clears throat> kind of going forward, like, you know, again, we'll come back to the actual topical versions because there's a few other azoles that are only available topically. But, uh, you know, terbinafine is another very commonly seen, uh, both topical and oral, uh, formulation and topically very, very commonly used. And it's even available as 1% formulation over the counter. And, uh, this is going to be first line for a lot of these infections, um, for a lot of patients. Now, oral therapy also is very effective. A little bit more um, concern you know, in regards to things like hepatotoxicity with the oral form. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get closer to and talk about the individual tinea infections. But um, no, terbinafine, very, very good option for these this type of uh, infection. This is really what we'd be focusing on first line. And then the, the topical azoles would be kind of going uh, further. But um, yeah, just want to kind of differentiate between those, um, the oral forms. This, like I said, if you're thinking like who in the world's using voriconazole for these type of infections, nobody. That's the answer. <laughs> uh, but just threw them in there for review purposes. Um, the other oral agent that we have is called griseofulvin. Um, this is one that uh, definitely a good option for tinea infections when you need a systemic agent. Uh, maybe terbinafine is not an option. We'll talk about uh, one case where this may be even more effective than terbinafine potentially when we get to it. Um, when it comes to adverse effects, though, with this, um, photosensitivity is a concern, and then also some slight hepatotoxicity, so monitoring LFTs, depending on how long they're going to be on treatment. And that's the same with terbinafine as well, which we'll come back to that when we talk about these. Now, one thing I want to make sure that we mention is good old nystatin. So nystatin, for those of you who are not aware, we are not ever using nystatin for this type of uh, fungal infection. Tinea, it's not going to be effective. Uh, so when we, when we think of like any kind of a dermatophyte, nystatin does not cover <laughs> that infection. I've uh, the the story I always the way I remember the, remember this um, is when I was in school. For, so fourth year, I, my first rotation, I was in this hospital um, working like in their dispensing like inpatient pharmacy, and we they were telling us a story about uh, a patient who had. Um, a tinny infection and the groin. So like, uh, um, spoiler alert, they call that jock itch. And, uh, the, I guess it was a first year physician. So an intern, um, first year resident, and they had, uh, they had written for nystatin, um, to treat, which is wrong by itself. But then also not only did they write for the wrong thing, but then they wrote for nystatin suspension to be applied topically. Oh, nice. Now, for those of you who are not aware, <clears throat> suspensions are typically going to be oral formulations. <laughs> it just means that they have the particles in the liquid solution that you shake up and you know, turn back into a, a syrup, if you will. This person, in th th this patient, got nystatin suspension poured all over their groin to treat their jock itch. So now, not only do they still have jock itch, but they have a very uncomfortable and sticky, messy situation. Sticky, syrupy. I was just like, and even as a fourth year, I was like, oh no, that's a gross miscalculation. <laughs> I'm imagining the difference in consistency between the suspension and the cream or the ointment. It's and, gotta uh, be. It's stark. Yeah, it's gotta be substantial. I, uh, I mean, you'd have to wear a diaper. Yeah, you definitely don't want it. No, it's not <laughs> ideal. So just remember that, folks. Don't use nystatin for tinea infections. That is ridiculous. And uh, keep the suspensions for the uh, for oral, <laughs> for oral, oral yeah. or interoral. We're using say. that for like thrush and things like that. Yeah. So I figured I'd share that story to maybe help you remember <laughs> that we don't use nystatin for these type of infections. I'll remember. There you go. If nobody else remembers, Cole remembers. I will. Okay. Do you want to talk about some of the uh, specific? Yeah. Yeah, let's, let's do, do that. that. 
So, um, start off with the most common one, probably. Yeah, yeah. One of the most common um, is tinea corporis. Uh, so this would be an infection or ringworm of the smooth skin of the trunk, legs, arms, uh, or face. Um, so depending on where it is, it uh, might have a different um, uh, tinea name. So hands would be tinea manum, face tinea facei, maybe. Beard uh, would be tinea barbae. Um, and then, uh, wait for it <laughs> and tinea corporis, uh, gladiatorum. Yep. For wrestlers, for wrestlers, wrestlers have their own unique form of tinea. So where does this, uh, where does this occur? So if you, if you think about like typically wrestlers wear that, uh, weird looking outfit mm-hmm. when they wrestle, so it has like a, you know, a big opening around the neck and then the arms and the, the legs are also usually exposed. So that's usually where it happens. And when the reason they gave it a different, name is um one make wrestlers feel cool but two the uh it's if you see some of like if you go on like up to date or some of those resources and actually look at pictures of these infections they're usually quite extravagant as far as the amount of surface that it's covering it's not just like a little small ring it's like i think i did see a picture where it was like the entire neck yeah and it was in a weird like low location It, it basically just travels from like where the hell all the skins that it's exposed when you're in that um, wrestling goofy looking outfit mm-hmm. all the way down to uh, like even more it's covered because it spreads and then it, a lot of times these guys won't get it treated right away they won't notice it or whatever and it gets you know pretty rough um, and spreads to the rest of their you know, body it's I'm trying to think of another uh, of another sport that wears like so like would a leotard be similar Maybe, but I guess they're not but like they're not, wrestling like, with people rubbing they're not up against. Sw- they're not people. sweaty, slamming into each other. Yeah, and that's true. So I mean, maybe they. I don't know. I've never done one of those practices. Ice capades can get violent. That's true. Maybe. Yeah, but yeah. So wrestling. I, I did, and it has a cool name too. I actually looked that up because I was like, "There's no way." But that was literally Johns Hopkins uh, guy that has that listed as a version. And it's uh, gladiatorum. Gladiatorum. It's kind of cool. Yeah, nice. that's cool. Um, so these are typically caused by. Um, uh, so we talked about trichophyton, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, rubrum. Rubrum, uh, interdigitale, and um, uh, E. flocosum. Uh, it's generally, like Mike kind of described it, but well demarcated in circular patches, itchy patches. Um, the borders can be scaly and uh, pustular, and that's usually how it presents. And, you know, as far as, you know, kind of establishing sort of like, you know, some information prior to treatment, it is important to kind of get an idea of, you know, where we need to go with, with therapy or make sure that that's actually what we're looking for. Cause not all cases of tinea um, corpus are going to come in and look exactly like standard ringworm. In fact, I went, I once I did a uh, talk at this conference one time that was like a multi um, specialty type thing. And I was, you know, doing something unrelated to this, but the person that went right after me was, was a, a dermatologist. And this guy, he was awesome speaker, turns out, but he came in like completely, he was like almost late to the, to his speaking, like scheduled slot. And he came in, he like had no presentation. He just like starts throwing slides up on the screen of like his actual patients, like Martin, like, you know, uh, skin infections and skin like conditions and stuff. And he was just quizzing the audience like, Hey, what's this? To me, every single thing looked like ringworm. Um, <laughs> I was like, Oh no, I'm bad at this. And, uh, and so he's going through and he's like, Nope, that's a nickel allergy. I was like, that's the difference <laughs> between me and a dermatologist. <laughs> but, uh, so he, he was kind of going through and it, it showed like for me kind of, kind of pushed home, like the differential diagnosis and the importance of that, because there's so many things that can look like this. I've always had like this very like, um, basic, you know, understanding of, of what a, I would expect ringworm to look like. And sometimes, you know, you can be right, but there's, it can definitely be a little tricky. So patient history is really important and kind of finding out like, you know, current or previous topical as well as systemic treatments that have been used. Has the patient had anything like this in the past? Um, you know, obviously looking if they have a patient chart, you know, that's that maybe they've been treated for a dermatophyte infection at your clinic before. So kind of getting that established is going to be really important. Obviously, uh, occupation can also kind of give you some clues. You know, if they're, uh, you know, work at a vet office, are they you know, work in some kind of a, a zoo or animal habitat, you know, situation, um, that definitely can, uh, even a pet shop obviously can really uh, increase the chances of, um, 
contracting one of these these uh, tinea infections, um, do they work um, on uh, any kind of a farm or land that has farm animals on it? Um, and then, you know, do they have uh, a history of like playing contact sports or, like wrestling? Um, do they garden? Um, believe it or not, a lot of soil has these these uh, dermatophyte spores in there. Um, do they have pets at home? You know, does their does their pets have any kind of like spots that have you know their hair missing or anything like that they just attributed to this you know the the dog just kind of scratching himself or what how would have you but getting a really good kind of like patient history can be important because you know some things can definitely look like these tinea infections and, and be in some cases even much more severe like for example secondary syphilis can actually present like some of these tinea infections and that is definitely not one that nope. you want to miss nope. um, because tertiary is, is the next step and the that brain. starts affecting the brain and that would be a big miss if you kind of look past that. Um, obviously, a lot of the people listening are going to be pharmacists, so we're not doing a lot of the diagnosis stuff, but you never know. You may be at least in, uh, involved in the potential uh, kind of discussion for what's being, what the what the patient has going on. So, yeah. impetigo can also be confused, especially on the face, obviously. Uh, you know, it can kind of mimic that. Um, Seborrheic dermatitis, uh, contact dermatitis, um, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and, and there's lots of different things that it could potentially be. So if you're not sure, um, you definitely want to get some more clarification on the patient's history. Also ask them if they've used a uh, topical steroid. Uh, a lot of patients will see red, you know, itchy area and their first reaction is to go get hydrocortisone cream over the counter or maybe they have some trimcinolone in that one pound jar that's available and they're like, yo, I got this huge, you know, thing from three years ago that, they, <laughs> that I shouldn't have gotten and uh, I'm going to use this. Um, obviously, steroids by themselves, very uh, – potentially counterproductive when it comes to a fungal infection because now you've just completely wiped out your normal flora of bacteria on the skin that kind of keep the fungus at bay, if you will. And uh, now you've taken away your defenses uh, and thus the fungal can, infection can grow uh, unopposed. So you just gave it a, a buffet to, to feed on on your skin. So. Fungal buffet. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I remember some people with impetigo when I was in high school, and it does really look like ringworm. Mm-hmm. I remember us saying that looks that's ringworm, and they got it checked out. Impetigo. Impetigo. <laughs> Mupirocin is a lot different than uh, or, or oral antibiotics yeah. are going to be a lot different than a topical cream or something for fungal infections. This is true. So speaking of our topical creams, um, so kind of depending on the severity of what we're looking at. So if we're looking at a localized, uncomplicated, non-inflammatory lesion. Um, a few options that we can use. So Mike said we would kind of talk specifically about some of the um, topical options and then some that are only topical. Um, So terbinafin, 1% cream, the Lamisil, widely available. Um, Use it once daily for one to two weeks. That could be an option. Um, Like I said, this is kind of low severity, uncomplicated, non-inflammatory. Naftaphine, branded as Naftin. It's a 1% or 2% cream, 1% gel. Um, Can be used for one to four weeks. You do the cream once a day. You do the gel twice a day. Um, there's Ciclopurox, uh, Loprox is it's branded as, 1% cream twice a day for two to four weeks. This is also approved for um, cutaneous candidiasis and seborrheic dermatitis. Um, also, tol, tol, Tolnaftate? Tolnaftate, yeah. Tenactin. Tenactin. Well, I know the Tenactin. Tough actin, Tenactin. Tough actin, Tenactin. I'm commercial. Branding it. Uh, 1%, you can do that twice daily uh, for one to four weeks as well. And then we move into some of the azoles, which we've already talked about some, like clotrimazole. Um, the brand name for the topical version of that is the is the Lotrimin or Lotrimin AF. But we also have like uh, Econazole one percent, um, and which is under the brand name Spectazole. Uh, we have Ketoconazole topical um, option, uh, Nizoral. We have the Myconazole. We have Oxiconazole. We have Sulfconazole. So we have several different options uh, now. From, to me, the takeaway is one adherence, and you know, anytime we have to tell a patient to take an antibiotic, apply something topically, as soon as the the infection gets better, you know, or looks better, the patient's most likely going to stop taking it. Um, the recommendations are, are to typically you know use the the topical agent for you know five to seven days, like after the infection kind of clears up, just to make sure it's fully actually eradicated. Um, and so, th- if you look at some of the you know the, data, the comparative data that is available, like some meta-analyses and things. When you start looking at like the minimum time as far as treatment goes, terbinafine does seem to look like it's probably the top dog um, when we think about like a one-week treatment option. 
Plus, it is once a day. Uh, anytime we can cut down from twice a day to once a day for most patients, especially if they're not, if it's not something they're taking, you know, chronically. Uh, you know, that's one thing if we're splitting lisinopril dosing to twice a day to optimize efficacy. That's something they're going to be on for a while, or potentially forever. Uh, in this case, you're talking about a week or two. It, getting somebody, I know for me personally, like if I, I'm going to forget one of those doses, mm-hmm. and so. Um, once a day, obviously, is going to be a good option. So that kind of narrows the the option list down. And then lamisil or terbinafine um, for one week does seem to have the best outcomes as far as treatment. The other thing is, you know, considering the cost. So some of these agents are going to be a lot cheaper than others. Like if you're going to use one of the azoles, clotrimazole, definitely over the counter and, and much cheaper than something like the econazole um, cream in some cases or the. Uh, um, the maybe the, I guess econazole is generic now, so it's probably cheaper. But the sulfconazole, I think that one's still brand name, if I remember correctly. And uh, so you also have to you know apply for three to four weeks, and like it, you're talking a lot of the azoles a lot longer treatment. And so yeah, terbinafine once a day for a week, you can get away with a lot of times. That's definitely going to be a good option. Pretty good option. One um, adherence trick that I saw was uh, you mentioned the large tubs of Triumph Cinnamon Cream mm-hmm. is to kind of prescribe a large tube. And then even if the um, infection has resolved, they might feel like they need to finish the tube. And so, you know, they might they might use it up and yeah. uh, make sure it's eradicated, even though they, whereas they may have stopped if they saw that the symptoms were resolving. Now, now the we mentioned steroids and topical steroids. Uh, now, if the patient has a tinea infection that does have, you know, pretty severe inflammatory lesions, you know, it's formed pustules, there's, you know, obvious inflammation happening. Um, we can combine a topical antifungal with a topical corticosteroid. That's going to be okay. So, for example, we could use terbinafine and hydrocortisone together, you know, and, and allow them to, you know, you might want to apply one, let it dry, and then apply the other. Um, in that case, because the, the antifungal is keeping the fungus, uh, you know, kind of controlled and, and eliminating that fungus from that end, then the steroid's there just to eliminate the inflammation, just making sure that patients do not use the steroid by itself. Uh, and then there's also a combo product. So there's a clotrimazole and beta um that's in, you know, combination already pre-made under the brand name Lotrazone. And that one is a, a good option if you're worried about, you know, patient having to apply two different um, topical agents. I'm sure some compounding pharmacies make their version of, you know, combos like that. But uh, yeah, so that's definitely an option, but make sure if they're going to use a steroid, one, it's only used if we have severe inflammation, and two, they have to use it with the antifungal. Right. Don't let them use just the steroid. Yeah, I'm sure they could compound it, but there's a whole bunch of different strengths of the um, clotrimazole beta methazone options, and it's yeah. used like all the time. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so hopefully we prescribed one of these options and it uh, eradicated the infection, but in some instances it may not. Um, so if topical therapy... Um, so there are some sometimes when we may need to consider systemic therapy, oral therapy. Um, those instances might be if topical therapy fails, if a patient has an intolerance to one of the topical agents, or if there's a, a really large extensive area involved, um, and or if there's um, involvement of a hair follicle. Um, so we might consider systemic therapy in that instance. Also, if uh, topical therapy fails, uh, make sure we're kind of reevaluating the differential diagnosis and consider a misdiagnosis. Uh, rule out things like HIV or other systemic diseases that might be uh, a culprit before uh, initiating the systemic therapy. Um, If possible, um, species identification uh, would be great to have before starting systemic therapy. Um, Assess drug interactions. Mike mentioned itraconazole and the vast amounts of drug interactions, but there's a lot of uh, drug interactions with with many of the uh, oral azoles and some of these others as well. Um, liver function in general, when I think antifungals, I think uh, liver function. So monitor that and get a CBC prior to uh, and during systemic therapy if the duration of treatment uh, is longer than four weeks. Yeah, and when we talk about like kind of culture and sensitivity type of reporting, we always think antibiotics and infections, you know, along the bacterial route. But um, you know, with with species identification, when it comes to like fungal infections, like obtaining a a, a slide of um, they they call them a a potassium hydroxide uh, preparation, KOH, uh, and you can get that on like a standard slide and kind of grow out that. And there's certain things they can look for um, that will basically tell them uh, and point you in one direction over the other um, versus other types of, uh, whether it's a fungus or a yeast or something like that. So th- there's some some techniques that you can use there. We won't, for time's sake, we won't get into all that today, but uh, definitely um, if you're more interested in that, check, check that out because that's a pretty cool um, process. But just to give you, you know, some examples of, you know, some 
oral options. Terbinafine still going to be when we're especially when we're talking about tinea um, corpus. We're we're thinking uh, terbinafine uh, for two to four weeks. Um, a lot of patients will end up being on it for four weeks, but it's once a day, and you know that can be. In most patients, very uh, useful with low side effect profile. We don't usually think about liver toxicity until after that four-week period, like Cole was saying. Now, I, I, I used to think kind of like, hey, you know, hepatotoxicity, that's like a more of a textbook thing. I've actually seen one patient at my clinic who was a younger patient, you know, I think I want to say early 20s, no history of uh, hepatotoxicity whatsoever. Um, liver functions shot up to like the 400s um, mm. on both the uh, LFTs, 400s, jaundice, I mean like all the, the signs. And the only thing that changed was the turbine. We checked him for all kinds of forms of hepatitis and, uh, you know, checked his alcohol consumption, all kinds of stuff. Turbinafine was the only thing that was added. And we stopped our turbinafine immediately, obviously, and then those liver functions came down over the next few uh, months. So definitely just be aware of that because it's something that I think we, we tend to – not really think about, yeah. Um, but uh, it, it can happen. It's very rare. It's the real deal, uh, though. But it can happen. And it, we do not want to script someone's liver. <laughs> no. So itraconazole and fluconazole, like Cole was saying, are are, are options as well. Um, itraconazole is is you can either do like two hundred milligrams daily for two to four weeks. Um, you can also do twice daily for seven days. But again, drug drug interactions like crazy. Um, fluconazole once weekly with the one hundred fifty milligram tablet. Um, for two to three weeks is probably a much safer, better option. And there's also, uh, you know, you, there, there is a oral ketoconazole, but because the liver uh, or uh, hepatotoxicity is very much a risk with that, I would stay away from that one. Um, Griseofulvin is another option as well, but um, probably a little bit better for more um, like scalp issues and things like that, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, the other thing is a lot of times when we think of terbinafine, kind of going back to our first line option, even, you know, orally, we think of like, Patients that are 12 and older, um, or, or you know, at least adults, um, is like kind of the standard for that. But there actually is pediatric dosing available um, that's based on a, a, it's a weight based dosing for terbinafine. So if you want to take a look at this, it's basically if a patient weighs 10 to 20 kilograms, you can do 62.5 milligrams once a day. 20 to 40 kilograms, it's 125 milligrams once a day. And then above 40, 40 kilograms, it's the 250 milligram once daily, like adult dosing. And, you know, we typically want to, if, if we can, we want to get um, a species identification because that can, if it's a trichophyton infection, then we only need to treat for like four to six weeks. If it's a microsporum infection, then we may need to go six to 12 weeks. So that's where things can change. So again, terbinafine does not, exclusive to adult patients or patients that are over the age of 12, even though, I mean, I, I feel like even like I was, I was, I was in school, I learned that you wouldn't give that to kids. So something at least to consider there is weight based dose or weight based dosing um, that you can utilize. Um, but yeah, so, you know, as far as the terbinafine goes, the low drug drug interactions, if you are treating for four weeks is for an adult patient, you know, no reason to check LFTs at baseline unless they have a history of, of liver disease. But uh, if they do, then just go ahead and get a baseline. And if you have to go past four weeks, go ahead and um, run the labs at that point. Um, anything else with ringworm of the, the corpus. trunk? Yeah, yeah, of the corpus variety? Yeah, we have a, a, a few. Well, um, we can move on to another common one. Yeah, and that's going to – we have mentioned earlier when I said spoiler alert, but uh, tinea cruris is basically jock itch. And the good thing about this is the treatment options are going to be very, very similar to what we just talked about with the corporis. So um, jock itch is obviously going to be a lot more common in males than it is females. Um, and when we think of like risk factors, you know, patients that have copious amounts of sweating, um, a lot of times athletes um, will get this as well. And, uh, or I guess if you just have hyperhidrosis, <laughs> then, then, you know, I was about to say, it sounds a lot like me, copious amounts yeah, of sweating. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a big, big, uh, sweater as well, but, um, you know, definitely something that can increase your risk. Obesity in general, diabetes, um, especially uncontrolled diabetes or immunodeficiency uh, can all put you, the patient at risk for getting this infection. Um, and you know, it's not always just on the groin area or surrounding the, like on the legs and whatnot. It can actually affect the perineum, the perianal areas, the gluteal cleft. It can affect the buttocks and, um, really the inflammation that c could potentially be present is something that, you know, is 
pretty severe and, and very uncomfortable in that case. Now, the good thing is, um, especially in males, it doesn't, even though we kind of would think it would, it doesn't really affect like the actual genitalia um, or the scrotum or anything like that. And so it does stay on the actual surrounding areas pretty nicely. But um, inflammation is definitely a big, uh, big uh, concern, and so that's where you will definitely see lo- lotrazone, the the combination of the antifungal plus the, um, the steroid, utilized a lot more frequently. Um, or, you know, you can use any of the other options we talked about and add a steroid to it as a separate agent. But um, do consider using the steroid in that case for the inflammation piece of it. Um, just don't forget the antifungal. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot of these are unpleasant, but I feel like that one is particularly so yeah though the one that i'm more familiar with is uh, the next one we'll talk about which is athlete's foot tinea pettis uh it has uh, kind of similar common causes um rubrum interdigitale flocosum um it's acquired by direct contact with the organism frequently f- through locker rooms which is probably how i got it um or swimming pool facilities gotta wear those little uh flip-flops right the slides yeah 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 the only the only place the slides are acceptable <laughs> especially when it's the uh the only thing the ymca pools yeah those are yeah Yeah. filled with pettis um there are some risk factors like diabetes and uh wearing um, occlusive uh, footwear can be risk factors as well so there's some specific clinical features of this um it can present in in some different ways um so interdigital uh, would be uh, common pruritic erosions or scales between the toes um and you can also have fissures um in that area as well um, you can have um, hyperkeratotic um, tinea pettis, and this would be described as like a moccasin type, um, where you have um, a hyperkeratotic eruption involving the soles and the medial lateral surfaces of the feet, and um, this is going to uh, require some a bit different treatment. Um, also, um, you can have inflammatory tinea pettis, which would be fasciculo bolus. Yep. Um, so puritic and painful vesicular or bolus eruptions, um, uh, the medial foot is, is often affected here. So when you have these different clinical features, um, the differential diagnosis might be a little bit different for each one. So for the interdigital, um, we're, we're thinking maybe candida infection versus um, tinea pettis. For the hyperkeratotic, we're thinking atopic dermatitis, chronic contact dermatitis, um, palmoplantar psoriasis versus tinea pettis. And for the fasciculobullus, bolus, we're thinking acute contact dermatitis or scabies yeah. versus tinea pettis. And I mentioned earlier, like kind of getting a, a potassium hydroxide prep um, to kind of identify the species. This is an example of where this can really come into play because a positive uh, potassium hydroxide prep that shows what they call segmented hyphae distinct, distinguishes tinea pettis from a non-fungal disease. And if it is if it is fungal, but it's uh, a candida infection as opposed to a tinea infection, then the potassium hydroxide prep will show like budding yeasts as well as what they call pseudo hyphae and and um, uh, septate hyphae. And so that can be a way of kind of like, again, that's, you know, if you're just, if you're a pharmacist, you're probably not doing the, the differential diagnosis piece. Uh, but just so that you've at least been kind of, you know, seen some of that and, and are aware of it, just uh, in case you're working with a new, uh, a new provider, uh, you can kind of offer your two cents if needed. But uh, that can obviously change directions of how we are going to end up treating the patient. And so that can be a good idea. Um, you know, we, the treatment options, you know, really antifungal um, topical therapy is like just some of the ones we've already discussed. Um, going to be the same type of uh, thing here. We're, we're going to start with that. And if we have refract- refractory infection, you know, the the systemic agents may, may play a bigger role you know, in that case. Now, um, adjunctive therapy is kind of what we haven't really talked about yet. And, you know, if there's like a situation where um, there's vesculation or maceration present, uh, we may end up having to use sort of like a um, what they call burrow solution um, or some form of you know generic form of this where they use aluminum acetate. Um, there's like one percent and five percent. You can kind of soak dressings in, and that will help to uh, basically dry up and, and reduce the moisture and maceration of the feet. And apply the you can, the patient can be told to apply the wet dressings for 20 minutes. Uh, two to three times per day and even using like cotton balls to kind of put in between the toes can also be an effective way um, of kind of if it, if it is um, 
in between the actual toes. You'll see this a lot of times between like the third and fourth um, toe, uh, which is your, your smaller toes, obviously. And it can be hard to uh, get good kind of contact um, and they're close together. So um, not only is the cream going to be a little bit, you have to put a little bit more effort into applying it, but um, with the, the cotton balls uh, kind of helping to help dry up everything, it can keep, um, you know, if the person does have, very sweaty feet can keep those uh, from making it worse or at least coming back. Now, once you've treated the patient and, you know, let's say that they've had recurrent infection or what what have you, you know, once they're treated, we do want to talk with them about prevention. And so, you know, if the patient was working outside or working in some kind of environment where they are getting sweaty, um, making sure that they're using socks that have like some form of like wick away material to help kind of keep the, the, you know, airflow to the feet a little bit better than the sweat dried up. Um, you can use like uh, um, desiccating fo- uh, foot powders or um, antifungal powders to kind of treat the shoes to sort of prophylactically treat. Um, like there's uh, Zeazorb, I think is the myconazole powder that's available over the counter. Um, and then also talk to them about occlusive footwear. I mean, obviously Crocs, not a great option for a lot of people, but something that's a little bit more breathable than, you know, certain, holes certain things. Yeah. So maybe not that, uh, might not be stylish. Yeah, definitely not stylish, but, um, you know, to each his own. I don't know. They, they have a lot of different, uh, branded croc, like, um, styles of croc. Now I think they even have like croc dress shoe looking things. <sighs> It's not all the... Cool. I better not ever see you wearing croc dress Dude, shoes. I've got like six pairs. Do you really? No. I was going to say, please, no. I have to get a new co-host, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Taking applications now. <laughs> First step one, do you wear Crocs? <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, teaching about the prevention, especially when it comes to like, you know, working construction or something like that. Um, work boots can be... I think they have steel-toed Crocs. God, <laughs> I'm joking. I was going to say, no, they don't. <laughs> That'd be great, though. That would be interesting. Just very uncomfortable. <laughs> But um, yeah, so tinea pettis, um, you know, it can be a little bit more tricky just because the reinfection can be very easy. Moving on to capitis. Let's move on to capitis. So capitis would be um, a tinea of the scalp. This is pretty common as well. And it has a few different ways that it can present. Um, so the first would be um, scaly patches with hair loss. It can be a single patch or multiple patches. Um, and this is a common presentation. So um, usually the patches enlarge in kind of a circular pattern over the course of a pretty long period of time, weeks to months. Um, and it can be, uh, I've seen some pictures where it's just all over the scalp and they're having hair loss throughout. Um, another way it can present is you may see um, patches of hair loss with like black dots. And this is because it can make the hair um, pretty brittle. And so the distal ends of the hairs can break off at the surface of the scalp. And you'll see those black uh, spots within the patch. Um, and uh, they're, they're present at follicular orifices uh, within the areas of the hair loss. Uh, you can also have more, have more widespread, as opposed to localized patches, you can have widespread scaling that doesn't have as significant hair loss. Um, so a lot of scaling uh, without clear uh, alopecia in, in that instance. Now, we also have something called carry-on that can happen, which is basically a, a severe manifestation of tinea capitis, which causes this like intense immune response to the infection itself. And so you'll have uh, kind of the development of these um, inflammatory plaques or pustules, um, thick kind of crusting and even drainage of the area that's affected. Um, tenderness or pain is usually present. And uh, carrion is, is most often caused by zoophilic dermatophytes. Um, and if left untreated, can actually lead to uh, scarring um, alopecia. So potentially permanently um, the alopecia may not uh, ever resolve. So so we have to really be aware that that's, that can be a little bit more severe. We need a treatment ASAP. And then there's also something called FAVIS, which is a kind of a unique clinical presentation of tinea capitis that's usually the result of an infection um, with one of the uh, – the dermatophytes we haven't really mentioned, um, it's much more rare, but, and I'm going to really butcher this one, but it's T. Uh, Scoenlianania. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to say it funny at the end. That, that, way, it, that way it sounds cool. Perfect. Um, yeah, not even close. But uh, so S-C-H-O-E-N-L-E-I-N-I-I. That's how you need to look that up. Um, but basically it can cause like this perifollicular um, erythema and it um, – 
basically progresses to uh, like a cup shaped like yellow crusts and they call those um, scutula uh, and they contain not only just the fungi itself but also neutrophils, dried serum and uh, epidermal cells and they can coalesce to form these adherent masses above um, areas that cause like this severe alopecia and it can have this unpleasant odor associated with it and the inflammation can be so severe that it causes permanent scarring and uh, it will potentially persist indefinitely unless treated with medication. So it's because some of these can be self-resolving in in some cases, but uh, this can definitely um, persist until we treat it. So, Yeah, and and with treatment with this, it typically requires um, oral or systemic treatment. Uh, So options that we've kind of mentioned previously, but griseofolvin for a long period of time, 8 to 12 weeks. Um, uh, it may be superior to terbinafin, especially if the infection is caused by one of the microsporum species. With terbinafin, you can use that. Um, it would just be a four-week treatment, and it would be better than griseofolvin if it's one of the trichophyton species. Um, alternative regimens would be fluconazole um, weekly and itraconazole um, pulse regimen, and, and that would be an alternative option. Uh, there's also shampoos that you can kind of use um, adjunctively. And for the carry-on specifically, um, systemic glucocorticoids are occasionally used in conjunction with the antifungal therapy if the patients have uh, very s- severe inflammation. And this is something that I think is important too for like when we told, when I brought up the pediatric dosing for terbinafine because this can be present in, in children. So don't think you have to just jump right to griseofolvin, um, which you end up having to treat for a lot longer. Um, with terbinafine, you may be able to get away with um, weight-based dosing of that and, uh, you know, treat with, with a, that option, if, if, especially if you're pretty confident or, or have a confirmed um, pathogen of, uh, or a confirmed um, identification of trichophyton. And so um, Cole mentioned the, the adjunctive shampoo. So things like selenium sulfide, which there's a 1% over-the-counter that's available. Um, I think there's a Celsin Blue brand that has that, that uh, agent in it. Um, yep, there is. And then there's also a 2.5% that's available as uh, a prescription. There's also ketoconazole shampoo, which is another good option. So using that a couple times a week on top of use, utilizing the uh, oral treatment can be good good adjunctive therapy. Yeah, we would dispense that ketoconazole shampoo all the time. Yeah. So things to consider. We already kind of mentioned some of these, but uh, the the family cat, family dog, um, especially kittens or puppies, um, it can actually be like kind of reservoirs for these type of infection. Um, and so if there's an outbreak of tinea in the household, so mo- especially if there's multiple people affected by it, um, definitely check uh, with the, bring your pet to the vet to make sure that they don't have any signs because they could be a carrier and not actually have symptoms. So even if you don't see any patches of you know, alopecia on the dog or cat, uh, it doesn't mean that they don't have it. So, um, good idea to get them checked by a vet. And then, um, you know, even if the, if the patient, if it's one patient in the household, but they keep getting reinfected, it may still be a good idea to get your household pet checked just to make sure there's no potential dermatophyte infection. Um, also keep in mind, obviously contact with any inf- affected surface. So this is where, you know, the, the hair, um, care tools like a comb and brush, uh, headwear, helmets, hats, anything like that. It can definitely, um, spread the infection. Um, and then if there's any kind of like bedding, pillowcases, you know, things like that, towels, even furniture, like if they're laying the, if it's a child, they're laying on the couch, um, it, the washing, you know, the, the potential affected areas as, as well as you can is a good idea nice finish up with uh oncomycosis oncomycosis so um you guys might be familiar with this term but this is effectively um an infection of the toenail that can cause disfigurement of the nail uh, as well as pain so it um uh it's a really pretty tough thing to treat a lot of times you'll you'll see you'll probably hear people complaining about it and they might attempt to treat it, but it uh, can frequently take a long time, especially if you use over the counter agents. So they usually give up beforehand. Um, but it can, um, cause some other issues. It can increase risk for, um, soft tissue bacterial infections in immunocompromised patients. Uh, it's frequently caused by, um, trichophyton rubrum. It's probably the most common cause, but there are some non-dermatophyte um, causes as well. Um, like a yeast, um, like a candida albicans. Um, a lot of patients may want to be treated for cosmetic reasons, but for um, otherwise healthy patients, you don't necessarily have to treat it. 
as kind of at the request. Um, there are some patients who may be susceptible, like we said, to increased risk for other infections that you would want to treat. Um, those patients might be uh, ones with a history of cellulitis of the lower extremity. Um, patients with diabetes um, and toenail oncomycosis who have additional risk factors for cellulitis like edema. Uh, patients who are experiencing discomfort or pain um, from the nails. So a lot of patients, it's kind of more or less asymptomatic, but some people have pain. Uh, and then immunosuppressed patients would be ones that you would want to um, get it treated and knock it out to prevent other uh, complications. Now, this is where the oral treatment is still going to be similar. Um, we're still going to usually go with terbinafine. However, this is where the liver uh, in, uh, becomes a bigger concern. So we're typically thinking at least, even for like mild to moderate infections, um, six weeks if it's fingernails that are affected uh, of daily terbinafine, 250 milligrams, um, or 12 weeks if it's toenails. So that's where we definitely want to start doing a little bit more monitoring of the LFTs. Uh, there are a couple different like pulse dosing options. So there's one where you can do 250 milligrams twice a day for one week. And then basically you repeat that every four weeks for three months. Um, that can also be effective. However, statistically speaking, it's less effective than um, the daily use for, for the six to 12 weeks, depending on the, the location. Now, that being said, it does, you know, it's been shown to reduce the risk of adverse effects. So it basically just has to be one of those things where you risk versus reward, um, you know, and, and kind of see, maybe include the patients, you know, the shared decision making is the term we like to throw around nowadays, and uh, kind of see which options fits best with them. If you have a patient with active liver disease or something like that, maybe a pulse dosing um, would be a good option. If we want to stay away from the oral terbinafine altogether, there are a couple topical options. So the jubula um, or the um, if Iconazole uh, ten percent solution is a, a topical uh, solution that you can apply directly to the nail. Um, now here's the thing: you have to apply it daily for recommended forty eight weeks. Forty eight weeks. That's a lot of weeks. Who is going to do that? I, I, I feel like after three weeks, you're like this. Is, I'm you know, done. I'm done with this. I tell you what. And here's the good news: one, it's besides the fact that it's super expensive. Um, the original study that was done comparing it to placebo, um, you were looking at like a 15 to 18% cure rate versus a 3 to 6% with placebo. So not a great... Might just take my chances. Might just take my chances. And uh, the adverse effects that were reported, um, ingrown toenails uh, occurred, some local skin irritation, um, discomfort. Um, you know, they occurred infrequently, but did still occur. And it's really just the length of time that it takes to treat and then the, the just... I don't know, the lack of efficacy, I would say. I know. Which, of course, if, if we're treating to prevent risk of other infections, then it might be more important. But um, yeah. for cosmetic purposes, I would probably explain to the patient kind of what it's going to entail and pretty, see what they think. Pretty expensive. Though, yeah, I mean, you know, if I didn't want, I mean, the toenails are yellow and probably, and fingernails, I mentioned mostly toenails, but fingernails as well. Yeah. I'm sure patients would, would want it taken care of. So there's a couple other treatment options that are used um, that are, are probably of um, lesser uh, preference. So there's um, Tavabarol, Caridian, 5% solution. So similarly, this is a solution applied directly to the nail once a day for 48 weeks. Um, as far as its efficacy, uh, one trial showed 7% of patients treated um, achieved both clinical cure and mycologic cure after the treatment versus 1% in the other group. So 7% <laughs> even less than the, the 15 to 16 in, in the previous uh, medication. Then there are some adverse effects that are possible, ingrown toenail, uh, as well as local skin exfoliation and irritation. Um, there's also a Pinlac solution, Cyclopyrox 8% nail lacquer. Um, you would apply this to the adjacent skin and the affected nails once a day and then remove with alcohol every seven days. And one trial showed um, no benefit when it's combined uh, with oral terbinafine uh, in, in these patients. So maybe just give them terbinafine. Maybe just give them terbinafine. So there's definitely some other um, types of uh, tinny infections that we didn't cover, like uh, bursa color or things like that. But I think we're getting close to being out of time. Yeah, I think we hit the big ones, though. Yeah. So there you go. If the closest we hit the big ones, we hit the big ones. I, I want to hear no complaining out of you listeners. <laughs> yeah, no complaints. Take it up with Cole. 
But uh, yeah, so if you guys have any questions um, or comments, concerns, anything like that, make sure you send us an email, which will be in the show notes. Uh, also, you can reach us on any of the social media platforms. If you want to send us a text directly, you can text 415-943-6116. You get like an automatic uh, response at first that will ask you to fill out some information like, you know, basically you can load up your name and, and email and stuff into our, our phone book that we keep. But uh, if you don't want to do that, just leave it alone and um, we'll get back to you on that as quick as we can uh and then uh, if you want more like lecture style um you know lectures <laughs> actual like traditional lectures um with powerpoint slides and all that good stuff check out patreon um so it's just patreon.com slash core consult rx and uh that link will be in the show notes as well and uh definitely big thanks to freece.com for continuing to partner with us uh we definitely have enjoyed having these episodes that are accredited and i hope you guys are liking them too uh if we can do anything better or do anything to improve the ones that are accredited and you know make it more impactful for your learning ability definitely uh let us know that but anyways thanks so much for the support and we'll catch you guys in the next episode have a great one